Today we are going to the 19th century. So sit back as we go to London. Henry Wainwright was born in the East End of London on the 12th of July, 1838. His father was an entrepreneurial man who during the first half of the 19th century built up a successful brushmaking factory. This enabled him to give his family a comfortable life and he made sure that his sons Henry and Thomas were well educated. When Henry finished his education, he joined his father in the business and when his father died, Henry inherited it. The factory was located at 215 Whitechapel Road in the heart of the East End of London. It was an area with many factories, but for the people who lived there, it was a poor, overcrowded area, and many people lived in cramped conditions without sanitation or proper ventilation. Whitechapel was filled with pubs and lodging houses, which provided shelter for over 8,000 homeless and destitute people per night. Henry, however, didn't have to worry about the poor social conditions around his factory, as he lived with his wife and four children in the upmarket Tredegar Square. Henry was well known in the area and seemed to be a popular member of the community. Most people considered him to be a highly respectable, hard-working businessman. He was determined to grow his business and build on his father's legacy. So he would go to the factory every day to make sure all the orders went out on time and that everything was running smoothly. The business grew and had many large and important customers. The factory was very close to the Pavilion Theatre and Henry would often go there and talk to the actresses. He would spend a lot of time speaking to the young women who he thought would be impressed by the fact that he owned a factory and was considered to be a wealthy and well-regarded member of the community. In 1871, Henry met a young lady named Harriet Lane. She was an attractive 20-year-old who had worked as a milliner's apprentice. She was young and lively, and he had become very much infatuated by her. The infatuation continued, and Henry wanted his young mistress to live closer to the factory, so he found an apartment for her at 70 St. Peter Street. Harriet started to call herself Mrs. Percy King, and she would walk around the area, safe in the knowledge that she did not need to work as all her accounts would be settled by Henry, who also paid her rent and gave her a generous allowance of five pounds a week. Henry juggled his time between the factory, his home, and the apartment he rented for Harriet. And over the next two years, Harriet gave birth to two children. Now with his extended family to provide for, Henry's double life was starting to be somewhat problematic. Harriet had become very demanding and asked Henry for more money. She didn't like to be the mistress of a well-respected business owner and pressured him to leave his wife and be with her. He was spending so much time trying to keep his complicated personal situation under control, but it diverted focus from his brush factory. In 1873, there was a worldwide financial crisis, which led to a depression in Europe and North America. The industrial nations such as Britain were hit hard by the sharp economic decline and Henry had been slow to react to the downturn. In 1874, he moved his secret family to less expensive accommodation in Sydney Square, but this did little to help his situation. Harriet started to drink, and when she drank, she became very indiscreet and would talk to anyone who would listen to her about her circumstances. Henry became very anxious, his business was failing, his debts were mounting, and Harriet was becoming increasingly more demanding. He needed a plan. Henry asked his brother Thomas if he would help him. His plan, however, was a relatively strange one. He requested that his brother write to Harriet, using the pseudonym Edward Frake. These letters would let Harriet know that the imaginary Edward admired her and would very much like to make her acquaintance. Thomas agreed and started writing to Harriet. Being a single mother of two in Victorian Britain, Harriet was not accustomed to receiving correspondence from eligible men and was very pleased to learn that she had Namara and very soon, the imaginary Edward and Harriet started to regularly exchange letters. 
Eventually the pair agreed to meet, so on Friday the 11th of September 1874, Harriet put on her best dress, which was grey with black buttons, a bonnet and a cape, and after leaving her children in the care of a friend and neighbour named Mrs Wilmore, she set off to meet the mysterious Edward Frake. Harriet did not return. Later that day, men who were working outside Henry Wainwright's factory at 215 Whitechapel Road thought they heard three gunshots. They told the constable and the area was searched, but nothing suspicious was found. The area was very busy and very noisy, and the constable told the men that noises are often mistaken for gunfire. A few days later, Henry went to see Mrs Wilmore, as he had allegedly received a letter from Harriet. It stated that Harriet and Mr Frake were getting married, and that Mrs Wilmore must look after the children. Henry assured her that he would pay her to care for them, but as Henry's business continued to fail, the payments became infrequent. A month later, Mrs Wilmore received a telegram from Mr Frake, informing her that he was taking Harriet on a little holiday to Paris. Mrs Wilmore was worried about the situation. Her friend would not have just abandoned her children and disappear. Harriet's parents were also very concerned, as it was totally out of character for their daughter to stop all communication with them. Harriet's parents went to see Henry to inquire about their daughter, but he told them that the last time he saw Harriet was when she asked him for some money, which he gave her, and she said that she was going to spend some time in the coastal town of Brighton. As the months passed, there was no more communication from Harriet. The economy was still in recession, and Henry tried to rescue his failing business. Mrs Wilmore looked after the children, and life continued in the East End of London. Henry's financial issues didn't improve, and eventually he was declared bankrupt. This meant he was only left with one option, and that was to sell the Whitechapel factory. However, the factory housed a dark secret, and one that Henry would have to deal with before any sale could be completed. So strangely, on the 11th of September, 1875, exactly one year since Harriet had gone missing, Henry went into his factory armed with a shovel. He removed some floorboards and then started to dig. It did not take long for him to unearth a body. The body was wrapped in cloth and in a state of decomposure. The smell was terrible, but Henry was determined to move it and any evidence that a crime had been committed at 215 Whitechapel Road. The body was heavy and too big for him to carry on his own. He decided that the best way to transport it would be in bags, and he proceeded with the grisly task of dismembering the decomposing body. Henry then carefully wrapped the pieces and put them in two bags before considering what to do next. He could not transport both bags at the same time as they were just too heavy, but he did not want to take one bag and leave the other, as there was a chance that it may get discovered, especially as the smell was so overpowering, and someone was bound to investigate where it was coming from. Henry sent a message to a trusted ex-employee named Alfred Stokes to come and help him carry the bags. Alfred duly arrived and was immediately confronted by a terrible smell. Henry instructed him to pick up a bag and take it down to the road so he could hail a cab. When they reached the corner of the streets, Henry put his bag down and wandered up the road to get the cab. However, the curious Alfred decided to look at exactly what he had been helping to remove from the factory and peered into the bag that he had been carrying. He carefully removed some of the cloth and could scarcely believe what he had uncovered, as in front of him was a human head and a human hand. He quickly recovered the package and closed the bag, and when Henry returned with the cab, he assisted him in loading his grim cargo, and watched as the cab slowly made its way up the Whitechapel Road. Alfred did not know what to do next, so decided to follow the cab as far as he could. Luckily the cab was a growler type that was pulled by one horse, and was slow to travel from street to street. Alfred stopped a constable and told him what he had witnessed, 
but the constable did not believe him and told him to move on. Remarkably, Henry instructed the cab to stop as he collected a passenger, his latest girlfriend, a young pretty dancer from the Pavilion Theatre named Alice Day. So as his ex-mistress's dismembered body was in the back of the cab, his new one sat up front next to him. Alfred continued his pursuit of the cab, passing through Aldgate and Leadenhall Street to the Hop Exchange. He then saw two more constables and told them about the body in the bag. This time the constables decided to act and follow the cab. The cab eventually stopped at 56 Borough High Street, which was a building leased by Henry's younger brother, Thomas. The officers approached Henry and asked to see what was in the bags and what was responsible for such a foul smell. Henry was very reluctant to open the bags and offered to bribe the policeman, but the constables were not interested and after opening the bags, they arrested Henry and his girlfriend Alice and took them to the police station. The police soon tracked down his brother Thomas, who had leased the building where Henry was arrested and interviewed the two men separately. The body parts were taken to St Saviour's mortuary and were examined by a pathologist. He found three bullets in the skull and told the police that the deceased was a female between 20 to 25 years old and who had had children. He also noted a distinctive scar below the right knee. Hair samples and clothes were all preserved for evidence. The police also conducted a search of 215 Whitechapel Road and found the shallow grave under the floorboards. They found a pair of metal earrings and two gold rings along with a pocket knife and inside the factory they also discovered a small six-shooter revolver. Alfred Stokes informed the police but he feared the body may have been that of Harriet Lane. The police then investigated her disappearance which led them to the house of her friend and neighbour Mrs Wilmore. Mrs Wilmore then gave them the address of Harriet's parents and they all came to the police station where they were shown the clothing found on the body and Mrs Wilmore said it matched what Harriet had been wearing when she last saw her on the 11th of September 1874. Harriet's parents identified the scar on the leg as identical to a scar their daughter had. They also confirmed that the jewellery found at Henry's factory had belonged to Harriet. The police considered that they had enough evidence to charge both Henry and his brother, Thomas, with the murder of Harriet Lane, but decided that they had no evidence to suggest that Alice Day was involved, so they released her. In November 1875, the trial of Henry and Thomas Wainwright began. The first witness called was Alfred Stokes, who told the court how he discovered the body in the bags and how he had followed the cab. He also said that Henry had told him that he had a shovel and a hammer that needed to be taken from the factory and discreetly sold. Henry's financial difficulties were highlighted in the court by the prosecution. They outlined his double life and how the recession had made a big impact on his personal life making it very difficult to maintain a second secret family. But the defence tried to turn this to their advantage by saying that the defendant had met a man in a pub who asked him to transport the bags to 56 Borough High Street and since he found himself in very poor financial circumstances he thought that it would be an easy way to make some money. They added that the defendant was not aware of what he was being asked to move. The defence also questioned whether the body was actually that of Harriet Lane. On Wednesday the 1st of December 1875, the trial ended and the jury deliberated the case before returning to court to deliver their verdict. Henry Wainwright was found guilty of murder and the judge sentenced him to death. His brother Thomas Wainwright was found guilty of being an accessory after the fact and the judge sentenced him to seven years in prison. The judge also ordered that Alfred Stokes be rewarded with a sum of £30. On the 21st of December 1875, on a cold winter's morning, Henry Wainwright was taken from his cell as a large crowd gathered outside Newgate Prison. And even though public executions had ceased seven years earlier, 
His crime was so notorious throughout the East End of London that the locals wanted to be sure that the sentence was carried out. There was a loud cheer from the crowd when the black flag was raised, signalling that justice had been done. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case.